I don't really consider myself a, a glass artist, but more of a broad-based visual artist. And, uh, but I do like fire. Uh, give me a coat hanger, some steel wool, and a match, and I'll do that. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've thought about is that we're all hardwired in very different ways. And if uh, probably if I, uh, in the best case scenario, if I could go back, if I could be a linguist, I would be most happy because I'd love to be able to speak in your language in many different languages as well. Um, and I've come from a very small Midwestern town in the United States and I was very interested in seeing the world and I thought language would be the way to do that. But my ability in language is only so-so. As a matter of fact, I thought I absolutely could not learn language, and so I went towards art where I felt more comfortable. Um, but I taught 11 years in Japan, and I learned Japanese when you want to eat. It's amazing <laughs> how much you can learn. But um, anyway, um, <clears throat> this is a quote, one of my favorite quotes from a writer in Scotland, Neil Gunn. I've been spending a lot of time way up far northeast in Caithness. Uh, you go any further and you hit the Orkney Islands, there's a uh, glass uh, uh, entity there called Northlands Creative. It says, often when I'm looking for a thing, I find something else. <clears throat> so I'll start out with a plan. Um, to live in so many different countries uh, was never a plan for me. It just kind of happened. For the last uh, three years, I've been going quite a bit to uh, Shanghai and Beijing, and, and uh, I've been curating an exhibition, an international exhibition for a gallery called Levant Gallery in Shanghai and have connections with the Shanghai Institute of Visual Art and also the China Art Academy in Hangzhou. And this is Japan. I spent 11 years there, but uh, I didn't know how in imagery to describe uh, my experience in terms of teaching there. But uh, many of my students now have gone on to be professionals in the field themselves. One of the things I'm very interested in is visual culture. So um, right now I'm living and teaching in Riga, Latvia. Um, and uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, if you know where Finland is, I'm not sure how many people even know where Riga Latvia is, but uh, if you go from fin Finland, there's the Baltic Sea and Estonia, and then Latvia and Lithuania. Um, <clears throat> anyway, and walking around the streets of Riga is so much different than walking around the streets here or what you see and experience in China or in Japan. And... Uh, I think that, you know, we really don't look at ideas, we look at what we see. And uh, from what we see comes ideas, and that's something I'm very, very interested in. Um, this is, I have a home base in uh, upstate New York, and I live outside a small town called Honeyoy Falls, and that's the falls. Um, this is where I live, and this is my studio. You see a shadow of my dog there? And when I'm not in my studio, I spend a lot of time on this lake, so I uh, really like to be out in, in nature. And uh, this is uh, what they call the Finger Lakes area, very deep, uh, clean glacial lakes. It's an absolutely beautiful area. And uh, um, <clears throat> I know just enough about sailing to be dangerous. So you notice there's no other boats out on the lake, um, but I'm, I'm trying to learn. And now I'm at the, um, the Art Academy in Riga, Latvia. That's the academy and my, a couple of my colleagues there. And one of the things I've, I've been teaching there, I do a lot of different things, um, but is this process called vitography, and it's using glass, eight millimeter glass as a substrate for printing. And uh, this is uh, one of my students, one of their first prints, and they print it on the front and the back. And uh, one of the things I'm interested in glass is uh, the phenomena that you would associate with glass. And paper has a lot of that, a lot of those same kinds of phenomena. So uh, 
For example, if you print on the, the front, uh, if you engrave text onto a glass plate and then you print it onto the front of your print, the text is going to read backwards. But uh, if you print on both sides and then I iron paraffin into the paper, it makes it quite uh, more transparent and translucent and the back can feed through to the front. Um, this is one of the projects I did uh, with a colleague of mine. Um, one of the things I've done a lot over the past 10 years is, is do a lot of collaborations with, uh, uh, with people in various different disciplines, poets and, and uh, sometimes dancers and different things. Um, this is with my friend and collaborator, uh, Nguna Aldera. And we had, a, uh, this is in a, old kind of abandoned building in Gulbane in Latvia. And what we did was we took uh, a lot of objects that we had on our shelves and in our studios and that were uh, too precious to throw away and still we didn't know what to do with them. It's like that closet, you know, next to your bed where you throw all the things that you uh, don't want to throw away but you have no reason to keep. And so we put them all together in a into a work. And there is a performative aspect uh, in this where we uh, kind of covered everything in wax. This is a cast glass wolf skull. <clears throat> and so you can see uh, blown glass and uh, glass casting, engraving on the outside. This is a just happened last uh, Saturday. Uh, one of the things I've done that I thought I'd never do is I joined a traditional Latvian dance troupe. And uh, the group's name is called Spregulus. They've been dancing together for about 30 years. And they had their 50th year anniversary. So I worked uh, with Nguyen Aldera on creating this kind of installation of fiberglass and resin in their photographs. And, and then from this central kind of bowl, the dancers would go up and connect the threads with, uh, with their own pictures. Uh, this is kind of the process of making that. So essentially, it's kind of a glass piece. <clears throat> that is Inguna and her dancing. And uh, that's <clears throat> me. And uh, we've been um, involved in teaching this course. Uh, it's, it's really quite new for us, but it's an attempt to combine uh, painting and sculpture and performance. Uh, we call the course Impetus, and it was done at first at the academy. And we had students uh, through the Erasmus program from many different uh, universities throughout Europe. And this is one of the students' work, another one of the students' work. We went, then went to Lithuania, to Vilnius, and taught the same course. And then uh, this past uh, um, fall, we were in uh, Japan at the Osaka University of Art. During one of my sabbaticals, I taught for a year at the Osaka University of Art. And one of the things that they are quite familiar there with, with in their culture is Sumie ink brush painting. And so we worked in the hot shop with the students to create instruments for uh, throwing ink around and painting with ink. And then we had like 30 some students involved in, in kind of creating, I don't know, maybe it's just a mess, but um, anyway, uh, there's the, the act of actually the painting. And then you can see some of the, the instruments there um, that were hanging above the, the painting. And in November, we'll go to the Shanghai Institute of Visual Art, and we'll do it there. And it's quite interesting for me. Um, I'm assuming I'll become more, more informed in, in really how to do all this. Um, I really haven't um, put a critical eye to it yet, because if I do that, I tend to do nothing. So um, first, I want to, to act, and then, um, and then later, I want to, to really become more critical. Um, 
This is another collaboration uh, done in the Czech Republic uh, in Novi Bor. Um, so the, um, there's fiberglass and that was painted and then hot glass was put over that to create, kind of burn away and create the clear areas. We used, uh, there's actually, the text is from a Latvian poem, which is a uh, water jet cut on glass and then slumped into a curve. And uh, <clears throat> this is from Scotland. And one of the things I was playing around with, are you familiar with the, this uh, process called dowsing? Um, my grandfather was a dowser. They called it water witching. My father used copper, copper wires. And uh, I found that I could do it too. Um, Although glass doesn't work for that, but it works metaphorically. And for, so it was kind of a way for me to, um, I'm trying to, I'm interested in performance. I wouldn't consider myself a perf any kind of performance artist, but uh, I don't let what I don't know keep me from trying things. As a matter of fact, I think it's, it's essential to start from a place of not knowing. And, and that's the only way you're gonna learn anything new. Of course, there's always refinement, but that happens over time. And so this is a way for me to be in the, the landscape. Uh, we also did a project um, with several of us on the island of Sarema off of Estonia, a very beautiful place. And you know, it's almost ridiculously funny because dowsing, you're supposed to find water, right? I found it. <laughs> and my friends there have a small glass studio on this island, so I, you know, we could make the glass dowsing rods. That's Mare Sare, uh, who's a well-known Estonian glass artist, and in Gunau Dera, who's taking uh, is in a field and is uh, adorning uh, each blade of glass with uh, Swarovski crystals, which is uh, kind of a, an act of hopeless optimism uh, that I like. Uh, there they have this sauna, and sauna in this area is, is very much a kind of uh, ritual. Uh, that was explained to me that there was a god that lives above this sauna. Um, there's a ladder there. I wanted to go up and see, but that was not allowed. And uh, uh, Inguna and Made were was doing a cleansing ritual there, and I was just kind of filming it. Um, and I think that these kinds of collaborative kinds of efforts are really important. It's it's oftentimes outside of of what I would call the parameters of what I do, but it's a way. It's it's about creativity, and it's about. Uh, learning something new. Uh, this is a collaboration I did at the Corning Museum of Glass with a painter from uh, um, the south, from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Judy Tuolet Stiwa. And uh, we started out in the library uh, looking at a text by uh, Josephus Flavius. Um, this was uh, handwritten on vellum um, in like the year 1200. And uh, there's a honey locust thorn tree outside which had these marvelous thorns and we were using that as a, a divining device to point at certain words. And uh, uh, actually that process of divining was actually used in the 1200s and uh, then we, we had to find and there happened to be the director of the museum's husband could translate this particular kind of Latin, and then we use that to kind of uh, think about the content of what we might do. And uh, we had these large uh, pieces of glass that are hand rolled through steel. And when hot glass goes through cold steel, it gets a wrinkled kind of skin effect. And we took a mold off of that, made waxes, used the thorns in terms of as kind of placement devices, and um, also had made, uh, you can see in the center, uh, image on, oops, sorry. 
Well, anyway, there's blown glass and solid work objects uh, in this. Um, so they're kind of a release. So this is a white glass. And one of the things we did was we uh, intentionally cast two different kinds of white glass that are incompatible meaning that the glass is cool at different rates so that we know that we were going to break. And then we, uh, there's a conservation department at the museum and uh, one of our, our friends, colleagues, uh, um, is of Japanese descent and uh, Ms. Uesato. And uh, she's been working on putting this back together for almost a year now. And there's a, this process I'm sure many of you have heard of called kintsugi, which is uh, if you have a broken uh, ceramic piece, you glue it back together with kind of uh, gold lacquer. And so we wanted to use that, that kind of effect. There's something about um, repair and conservation that I really love metaphorically, it, it does one of the most important things that I think art can do, which is elicit empathy. Um, anyway, we're not gonna read this, but uh, um, when it, this is also in Scotland, and I had the opportunity to do an installation there. It's at a old, in an old barn, which the old Scottish word for barn is called buyer, and uh, you can see the, the North Sea from the garden, and uh, this would have been an old vicarage, um, so it would have been considered, and still is, a kind of mansion. And the gallerist that I work with in Portland, Oregon, actually owns this house and has now used this, uh, uh, renovated this barn lovingly and has opened it up for artists to do installations. So this is the entrance to the buyer. Uh, this is how it was when I found it, and uh, I don't know particularly why, but um, I don't always like to change things so much, so almost like a mantra, I say to myself, things just the way they are. Um, try to, it's a form of acceptance, and it's a, um, maybe a way to assimilate what I'm really looking at rather than trying to wish it was something else. So I became very interested in how these workmen uh, place their tools at the, at the end of the day, a kind of chance composition. And uh, actually, uh, this piece of painted wood that uh, would have been for tethering animals, um, I actually removed that and then took a mold off of it and cast it in glass and then put it back in that space. And I became really good friends with, that's Bruce Sutherland and uh, um, uh, Ian Gunn on the, uh, the old gentleman, uh, lived right down the road and uh, I had interviewed him and, and taped that and I wanted to get a feeling for uh, how that space was really used. And I saw it as kind of a, a permeable kind of structure, it's a pl somewhere, uh, you know, there's the mansion which is cut off from the outside world, but the barn is kind of uh, me a mediator between the outside world and the inside world. So you can, there's molds for the, the cast glass. There's lots of uh, crows around the area. Um, so I cast these quite large cast glass crows. They're wrapped in cloth and in copper and in lead, which were also materials that I saw uh, around the area. Um, <clears throat> it's this incredible, this slate uh, walls that you see there um, go down into the ground about uh, two meters or so. Um, so I really have an appreciation for the, the builders of this. I cast a large uh, uh, cast glass lens, which I just hung, and, and um, it's related to a process called scrying, which the alchemist John D. Uh, had used, I think maybe just to entertain the queen, but it was this belief that these light reflections um, that the lens made was the language of angels. And somehow I found that just a beautiful thought. Um, these are an old pair of dancing shoes, and uh, I cast in glass with uh, wool. Of course, there's sheep all over that area, and uh, then little pins stuck in the shoes. Um, 
I took molds off of the tools, uh, cast them in glass, and you'll see some beeswax pattern on there, and that's, that's because um, I'm a beekeeper as, as well in upstate New York. Um, this is a, a performance and artwork, uh, just the drawing for one that was in Scotland, fiberglass and wax, and um, also um, these kind of fused glass words that were from a poem uh, by a Scottish poet. And then we set it all on fire, and uh, what you see on the bottom is kind of the remains of that, kind of blowing in the wind. Another project uh, outside of uh, <clears throat> uh, Riga in Latvia in an area called Ruiena. And uh, I work a lot with found objects and I always wanted to work with a house as a found object. And uh, there was actually a, this house was owned by uh, an, an elderly woman who was a seer. And she had to leave this area during the Soviet occupation because those kinds of people just were frowned upon. And uh, it was really quite interesting um, uh, talking to her. But I worked with uh, Imans Kikulis, who's a photographer, and uh, Inguna Aldera. Uh, this is Kazushi Nakata, who's Japanese, but happens to be teaching in, at Aalto University in Helsinki, Finland. And he is involved in, in identifying spaces that are about to be demolished or are kind of, in a sense, dying in a way, painting them all white and then photographing them. Um, Emons was uh, playing around with a, a pinhole camera, but also documenting the event. Uh, Inguna was, uh, um, created this kind of clothesline from the inside to the outside. Um, and in the evening was, uh, she's dipping it in wax, fiberglass, so the fiberglass doesn't burn, but the wax certainly does burn. And, and when uh, lighting this in the evening and throwing water on it, it bursts into to more flames. And I've always seen windows as kind of like the eyes, the soul of a building. And so I was engraving uh, in Latvian on the window and, and doing drawings of uh, kind of just things that I'd seen around it, knowing that the local kind of people in this country area were going to be walking by. And, and uh, if I wrote, wrote in English, it was going to be obscure, and I didn't really want to be obscure. And then later, we had a few days to uh, put together an exhibition in Riga, which was mainly about the documentation of the event. And now switching gears again. Um, when I'm on this, I have this small cottage on this lake, and uh, they have a boat museum on these, in this Finger Lakes area, and I took a boat building course there, and these wonderful drawings, are, it's a process called lofting, and I still want to learn more about that. Um, but for me, it, it's, uh, art's not the most important thing, it's just, it's a form of expression. Um, it, it's like somehow I'd, I would love to create some kind of interesting life for myself and uh, just in, inform myself. And uh, it, was, it was quite, I learned in a, in a little over a week how much I really did not know about boat building. Um, you know, you could devote a life to it. Um, and this was the boat that we, we built. And uh, these are some cast glass boats that I've made. Uh, with kind of hollow core, core interiors. Um, you see three different cores. You see the, the way the glass is placed into the mold, uh, the color and the, the size of the particulates from like a, a fine, medium, coarse frit to chunks of glass to slabs of glass depends on the way that the glass melts into the mold and it creates the, these kinds of effects in between the, the cores. Um, you get an idea here, you can see like the, the empty mold and then um, the glass. Um, actually, I open up the kiln door and I have my cell phone and it's so hot, but I have just long enough to take the, uh, uh, take the photo. Um, this was a piece in collaboration with poets uh, Forrest Gander and C.D. Wright, uh, 
CD is a MacArthur Award-winning poet, and Forrest just got shortlisted for a, a Pulitzer. Uh, they came to my studio. They liked these barometers, uh, which I made at the Tacoma Museum of Glass with a crew of the best glass blowers in the world, really, and so these barometers were quite large, and they wrote poems based on the visit to the studio and looking at the barometers, uh, which were used as early nautical devices to be able to gauge, oops, here we go. Um, so the, the barometers were used to gauge when a storm is coming, and uh, they wrote these poems called, um, the various different titles, but spill forth. And, and what happened, to, uh, this was first shown at the Cohen Gallery at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, there's a sound component too, which a friend of mine in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, created this uh, kind of Ar Arduino box or something. It, it, Anyway, it created a tonal composition in real time that was control that was uh, activated by uh, barometric pressure in the air. And I had my friend the uh, Forrest write um, the poetry underneath handwritten. And the day after it was installed, uh, a hurricane hit the area. So it these barometers started spilling forth and spilling forth onto the text and changing it. And uh, that was something that I anticipated and, and really, um, you know, had, had kind of wanted to because this piece for me was about kind of the fragility and the temporal nature of the human voice. We all know that voices have been silenced, books have been burned, that uh, even as I say this, uh, C.D. Wright has since passed, to, passed away, so her voice is uh, still with us in a way through her poetry, but, uh, you know, and um, irre we're all irreplaceable, unique entities, and uh, that's something to be cognizant of. Anyway, cast glass and text from Pablo Neruda's uh, Isle of Negra about the sea. Uh, this piece is uh, Cast Glass Crows. It's called The Keeper's Lament. It has to do with uh, uh, declining bee. Eh, it doesn't have to do with, I don't know, what. It's, it's somehow connected to my desire to keep bees as a kind of observational thing. Um, and um, we all know that our environment is at risk. And that sometimes makes me lament. Um, you could see uh, wrapped around the, the crow, an upside down crow, has pretty obvious connotations metaphorically, but this wrapping of this beeswax around it is kind of an attempt at, at healing. Um, I oftentimes take an idea and I run it through different materials. So this is cast iron and cast iron plate and magnets. Um, this piece is bronze, um, cast glass etched behind. Uh, set in brass, uh, like a jeweler would, but more on a large scale. Um, these are works in the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, this large display case was in the Harvard Natural History Museum, and uh, it, har it housed the um, Blaschka marine and botanical specimens, which were made out of glass and in, in contemporary, uh, really realistic um, but they don't know what to do with them now, really, in a sense. They're just marvels, uh, but they, uh, there's all this debate about how scientific these things really are. Anyway, they took out uh, some of these uh, pieces to make room for a coffee shop, and uh, um, I ended up getting the display cases because they were going to dispose of them, and they're beautiful cases. So I engraved the case with, uh, with B imagery, anatomy, uh, there's a hexagonal quilt on the inside and seven little silver bees and from with a strong top lighting the uh, engraved uh, glass puts imagery, shadow imagery on, on the, the quilt. Um, these works are made uh, with a silk screening process of vitreous enamels on glass. There are seven layers of glass that are stacked up and fused together. Uh, each layer can have different colors uh, with different 
uh, printed imagery on it, and I, I really like this kind of uh, depth that you can get with glass in, in that way. Um, that's me keeping bees, and uh, I'm not sure if this is art, but uh, the bees at the end of the harvest, I always write them a letter, a thank you letter, and I put it inside, and I dip it in honey for them and cover it with their wax, and they seem to enjoy it. I write them little love notes, and um, and these are uh, uh, cast glass beehives, um, skep beehives, which is not really a good practice, but there it's your kind of archetypical image of a, a beehive that I really like. Um, blown work, engraved work, um, cast um, added together. And we're getting towards, towards the end here. Um, I've started to uh, re reinvestigate old sketchbooks and, uh, and then <clears throat> engrave them into wax and then cast them into glass. And uh, one of the things I've been playing around with uh, right before leaving for Latvia, and uh, the idea is from now on to teach for uh, six months in Latvia and, and live or do whatever I do in the United States for six months. And uh, I've been playing around with this, uh, it's a form of painting. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a form of, of uh, painting in Japan and uh, they use rock mineral. Um, and uh, I thought that uh, what I use is an acrylic kind of polymer on, on uh, very thin hemp cloth, and uh, I paint with this, this acrylic, um, transparent acrylic, and then I, I sprinkle on um, all this glass powder, and then scrape it off, turn it, it's a very much like, uh, I'm very interested in uh, like Archimedes' palimpsest, where before paper on vellum, he would write, and then uh, uh, scrape off the imagery, paint white on it, turn it 90 degrees. And at RIT, where I taught, they were with new uh, visualization techniques. They could read the writing behind the writing, behind the writing, behind the writing, and that's really informative. And if you look up Archimedes' palimpsest um, and just Google it, it's really some of the most beautiful imagery. And I'm also very interested with this form of like a semic writing, which looks like writing, but is really, I don't know, maybe has a, a meaning of its own. It's a kind of gestural language, um, I suppose. And uh, then this is almost the last slide. Um, I had done some um, raku fired, they're actually just bisque fired uh, clay crows and I was covering, covering that with the polymer and sprinkling on different kinds of fritz and uh, anyway I'm kind of interested, it's like the Midas touch uh, uh, with this acrylic and, and glass powders, I could turn most anything into to a kind of glass, glassy, luminous surface. Um, anyway, thank you for your patience and your interest and always we're left here. Um, thank you.